Thanks for the uh, lovely introduction. Um, so yes, today I'm going to be talking to you about meta classes. Um, so uh, first of all, why meta classes? Why would you care about meta classes? Well, the short version is that um, there's things you can't do with classes, um, and meta classes lets you do these things. Um, and so I'll spend the rest of the talk trying to explain what those things are um, and how exactly you would do them. Um, so um, the reason why I started playing around with meta classes was uh, I was um, trying to use uh, nodes to run some test suites. And I ran into this problem where um, nodes will print out the doc string of your methods um, as it's running them. Um, and these doc strings aren't necessarily particularly informative. So if you have some you know, class A, um, and uh, it has a function called myfunk, it has some um, you know, doc string for the function, and then another class that inherits from A, um, and then you look at the doc string for both of those functions, um, they're the same doc string. So you don't actually know um, if you're getting that function through class A or through class B. Um, and so uh, this is um, normally not a problem, but in these like, specific cases, like when you're trying to use nodes for this, uh, it's, it makes it very hard to debug and see like, which of your test, um, test cases are actually passing and which are failing. Um, so I uh, set out to try to find a solution to this. Um, so the simple solution, um, which you might think of, is just to um, you know, include the information manually in the doc strings. Um, that's probably the best solution for um, simple cases. Um, you just change you know, A and B, there you go, you're done. Um, but if you have lots of methods or lots of subclasses, that can, this can get pretty arduous. Um, and so um, there should be a better way to do this a little bit more programmatically. Um, so, um, here's a, maybe a better solution to try to uh, fix this. Um, so what you could do is say, aha, I'll just edit the doc string um, in the init of the parent class, and then that'll fix everything. So you go um, and uh, you know, for each of your functions, in this case, it's just my func, but if you had more, you could do more. Um, uh, you know, look up the class name and edit the doc string so that it's prefixed with class name colon doc string. Um, unfortunately, this doesn't actually work um, because the doc strings for class methods are uh, not writable. You can't change them after the class has been created. Um, so it doesn't work to just edit them in a net. You need to do something a little bit um, more fancy. Um, uh, I'll note that in general, doc strings are writable for, for functions. If you just have any you know, random function, that is fine. But it's in particular um, methods the doc strings aren't writable. So um, this is like specific problem to classes in particular. Um, so is there a way that we can perhaps maybe change the doc string before the function becomes a method? Um, and the answer is yes. Um, so, but to take a step back for a moment um, uh, and just sort of give a brief refresher on um, the basics of classes. Um, so what's a class? A class is just a special type of object um, that creates other objects, and those other objects are called instances. Um, uh, remember that everything in Python is an object. If you haven't heard that before, um, now you have. Everything in Python is an object. Um, <laughs> um, that's the most important thing to remember from this talk, is everything in Python is an object. So you, all objects act basically the same. Um, uh, and so uh, to give sort of a real world example that I like to use is that a class is sort of like a particular you know, government form, a tax form, like the you know, 1040. Um, and then an instance would be your particular version of that tax form with all of your information written out on it. Um, and uh, so uh, we can ask Python what, uh, what flavor um, of object a particular instance is, what, type, what class it is. Um, we use that using this um, type function. Um, and so here it'll tell us that a inst um, is of type A, um, which is what we would expect because we created it from A. Um, but again, everything in Python is an object. So therefore, classes should have types too. Um, and in fact, if we look at what the class or the type of A is, we see that it is of type type. Um, this is kind of confusing because um, a lot of people use the term type in sort of a general sense. Um, but in Python, there's also the specific term of type. Um, and to make it even more confusing, there's sort of like three different ways that type can be used. So um, first of all, type will just denote like the flavor of object that it is. Um, uh, that is to say like the type of what a class is. Um, you can also use type as a function to tell you what 
uh, type of, of particular instances that you have, which is probably how you've seen it used before. And finally, you can use type to create new classes. Um, um, and that's the interesting part that uh, I'm going to be getting more into now. So, um, so how do you create a class on the fly? You use type. Um, this is how you've probably seen classes um, instantiated before. Um, probably you haven't seen them instantiated in a different way, um, but you can using type. It takes three parameters. Um, the first one is just the name of the class. The second is a list of uh, base classes or parent classes, so that's equivalent to um, what you would put here up in the parentheses. Um, and the final one is a dictionary of the attributes um, that the class will take. And so in this particular case, I just have the attribute for my func. Um, but if you wanted to have other variables or methods, et cetera, um, you'd put them in that dictionary. So you just pass those three arguments, and voila, you have a class. You don't need to use the special like, class syntax to do it. Um, OK, so now that we know how to create a class on the fly, maybe we can try this again, see if we can get our doc strings rewritten. Um, so um, uh, I've created a function here called make class, which has the same signature as the type function. But um, before it actually calls type, it goes through each of the uh, methods that are passed in and uh, rewrites them to, again, be prefixed with the class name. Um, so uh, we can call this um, make class A and make class B. But um, unfortunately, this isn't exactly what we wanted. Um, what we see is that. Uh, when we print the doc string of my func for a, it is in fact prefixed with the a colon, which is what we wanted. But then b is b colon a colon. Um, so how did that happen? Um, the answer is that uh, both of those classes a and b were using the same function in memory. So uh, when you uh, first rewrote the one for a, it prefixed it with a colon, and then you rewrote the same doc string a second time um, and got uh, b colon a colon. Um, and so if you actually use is, which does um, equality um, in memory, um, it'll show you that those two functions are exactly the same. Um, so can we um, uh, get around this by perhaps making them not be the same function? Um, so again, everything in Python is an object. So we can also create functions on the fly. Functions also have a type, which is the function type. Um, so here's a uh, function that takes a function as an argument, and then copies the function and returns the copy of the function. Um, you don't need to worry about too much about the details of how this works. Um, this is really getting into like the internals of Python. Actually, the first argument that it takes is like the compiled bytecode for the function. Um, uh, so um, it, uh, yeah, don't worry too much about like the specifics there. Just know that you can actually um, duplicate functions. Um, so we have this. Um, all right, so we'll take my func and we'll copy it to create my new func, um, and then change the doc string for my new func, um, and we print out the doc strings, and it is in fact modified. The second one is, the first one isn't. So this seems to be the behavior that we want. Um, so um, take three now. We'll try it again. Uh, we're going to modify our make class function to, before modifying the doc string, also copy the function that it's been given. Um, and then uh, create the class using these new copied functions, and hopefully this should work. Um, and in fact, it does. So um, here we have, we're making class A, making class B. They both take my func, which are the same object. But because this make class function now copies the functions, um, we get different doc strings for the two different methods. Um, so, <laughs> all right. So um, you might be wondering why I haven't mentioned meta classes in a while, given that this is a talk on meta classes. <laughs> Um, but actually, the whole time I've been talking about meta classes. So a meta class is just any callable, which means a function or a class that has a, a call method. Um, well, technically, meta class uses new, but anyways, um, uh, it's any callable that takes the parameters for the class's name, um, the class's bases, and the class's attributes. Um, and so type um, that we were using to create classes before is just basically the default meta class. Um, it just, that's what happens under the scenes. You never see it, so you never have to worry about it. Um, and the function that we've been developing, this make class function, is technically a meta class too. I know it's confusing because that's a function, not a, not a, not a class. But, um, uh, and so what makes this a meta class? Again, it takes these three arguments for the name, bases, and attributes. Um, it then modifies those attributes. Um, um, specifically in this particular instance by creating copies of the functions and then modifying their doc strings. Um, it then creates a new class using these modified attributes and returns the new class. That's all a meta class does is it 
you know, intervenes on class creation time, um, makes some adjustments, and then so the class that's returned is slightly different um, than it otherwise would be. Um, so, um, so now Python has some special syntax that we can use so we don't actually have to, um, uh, so if I go back to, um, so we don't have to necessarily make classes like this. We can still use our nice like class, class name, parentheses, colon syntax um, that we're used to. We don't have to do it like that. Um, that's a special syntax to do that. Um, oops. Um, but Python creates classes a slightly more complex way than the way that we've been doing it. In addition to the myfunc um, or whatever attributes you define, it'll pass in special ones like underscore, underscore, init, underscore, underscore, and um, various uh, variables too. So we just, I'm just adding to the for loop here to um, skip special methods and non-functions. So we're not going to touch those. Um, and then um, here's the syntactic sugar, which is just you add this attribute called underscore, underscore, meta class, underscore, underscore. Um, you set it to whatever your meta class is that you want it to be. So in this case, our make class function. Um, and it just, um, that's when the class is created. Um, that's basically like when you, you know, import the module or you run that Python file, the class is created um, and the meta class goes through, um, modifies the class. And so when you actually create an instance of the class and check the function, you see that the doc string is modified. Um, note that this is slightly different in Python 3. Um, the syntax is a little bit different. Um, this is for Python 2.7. Um, but uh, I'll be posting these slides online. Um, you can look up what the syntax is for Python 3. Um, OK, so just to take a step back, what exactly was it that we did, um, um, i.e. getting meta about meta classes? Um, so uh, again, meta classes intervene on um, the class creation. Again, that's class, not instance. So it's the thing that creates instances. We're changing that thing. Um, uh, and because we're able to intervene on class creation, um, we can uh, make some changes. And in this particular case, we copied the functions, changed their doc strings, um, and then we finally created the class using those um, modifications. Um, a quick side note, um, if you were to run the code that I actually gave you and, and try to do the subclassing thing, it doesn't actually still quite work, but the reason is kind of a stupid reason that I don't, didn't want to get into the details for. Basically, you need to, the myfunc is not an attribute that you would pass into B um, because it's already an attribute of A, which is the superclass. So in order to make this work, you'd have to go through manually all of the attributes of all of the parent classes. Um, I have all of the code on um, the blog post that inspired this talk, um, so you can go look at it if you really want to. But I think the cool part um, at all was that you're able to rewrite the doc strings um, for the methods that are part of the class originally. Um, so that's a um, fairly simple example of what you might use a meta class for. Um, you'll find other instances of people using meta classes. Um, one really commonly cited example is that um, Django uses meta classes to sort of simplify the interface. So if you create a, um, a for example, a person class, which is, um, uh, so forgive me if I get this wrong, I haven't used Django in a long time, but um, uh, if you create a person which is supposed to be a, a model for like an interface to your um, database or um, to represent uh, you know, various, uh, like a character field, integer field on your website, um, if you create that class and then you actually create an instance of the class, you'll find that the attributes aren't these like fancy um, character field or integer field um, uh, types, they'll just be like integers or strings. Um, uh, so it makes it a little bit easier to work with these classes um, as a user, um, and all of the fancy um, stuff underneath is handled by this meta class rewriting these attributes. Um, and uh, the source from this is this really great um, Stack Overflow answer, which I highly encourage you to go look if you, you know, want to find out more about this. Um, so a word of caution, which is that um, meta classes can be really hard. They can make your code really hard to understand. Like I get confused going back and looking at my code that uses meta classes, um, and I wrote the code. So if someone else is going to go read your code, um, like really there, you know, there are there are instances when meta classes are very useful, um, but you really should only use meta classes if you absolutely really really need to use them. Um, and there's this great great quote um, that's attributed to Tim Peters, who's a uh, he wrote like the Zen of Python. Um, 
Uh, Metacostas are deeper magic than 99% of users should ever worry about. If you wonder whether you need them, you don't. Um, the people who actually need them know with certainty that they need them, and they don't need an explanation about why. Um, uh, I think that this is true, though, unless you're like me and you just like kind of playing around with the you know, obscure parts of Python um, and coming up with a reason to try to play around with this. Um, I, so I, I think like the, the takeaway from this is I totally encourage people to play around with their own code, um, find out about cool things like this. Um, but if you're actually working on you know, code that's going to be used by people and, and read by people, don't use meta classes unless you are certain that's the thing you need to be using. Um, so that's it. Um, like I said, I'm going to be posting these slides. Um, so if you want to go back and look at the examples and stuff that I gave, um, you can just go to my website, which is jesshamrick.com. Um, and also, this presentation was created with IPython Notebook, which is awesome, um, and just automatically renders all of the Python code, et cetera. Um, it's great for uh, slides and everything else. But thanks. <laughs>Okay, that's a lot to think about. What <laughs> questions do we have for Jess? Just, just out of curiosity, have you looked at class decorators? Yes. So I, meta classes make my eyes cross. Class decorators like seem pretty obvious, but it seems like there's some, some limitations. Are there things you can do with meta classes you can't do with class decorators? Yes. So in this particular case, you could use class decorators to, to do the um, doc string rewriting, but then you need to use a decorator for every single method that you have. Um, which is kind of annoying. Sure. Um, uh, so yeah, this is a case in which if you don't actually want to do it for every single method, then you need to use something like a meta class. Um, but in a lot of cases, absolutely, decorators can do a lot of stuff that, you know, like it, it, if you think you need a meta class, you might be able to do it with something like decorators, so. Uh, if you have a class named C and a method called F, and you want to rename, I mean, change the doc string for it, you could say c.f.imfunc.doc equals the new value. And so that way you could change the doc string in place. Dot imfunc? Yeah, the I am funk. Interesting. Okay, didn't know that. Thanks. <laughs> we have one right over here. So, would you consider Django's usage of meta classes to be valid, or a good use case, or just one that's confusing? Um, I think in this particular case, it is probably a good use of meta classes because the way that you like create Django classes is. At least from my experience with Django, it's a little bit like you use it not quite like you'd use Python normally, anyways. And so um, it, I think it's probably fine. But I, I also like don't have enough experience with Django to like I give a confident answer to your question. Um, but I, I think it's probably good. Adam, I, uh, I actually have a response to that question. Um, I think that Django does a good job with meta classes, and it's because if you're just using the Django API normally, you don't know it uses meta classes. Mm -hmm. I, I, so the the advice that you put up there is totally valid. Earlier, um, meta, meta classes are great for doing complicated things inside of frameworks mm -hmm. uh, and inside of the framework. If as soon as it crosses that that end user API, you're probably doing it wrong. So. You don't know they happen in, in Django unless you really go into Django internals. So awesome use, great API. Okay, thank you so much for that great talk, Jess. Thanks.